Okay, so what are reserves? Now, a lot of this talk, I'm going to refer to what's called the 2007 SPE and various other companies, Petroleum Resource Management System, the PRMS. This is a system that's used extensively worldwide, um, and even those areas that don't use this particular system um, use systems that are very, very similar to it. So think of it very much as a, as a worldwide reporting system. So what does it define reserves as? Quantities of petroleum anticipated to be commercially recoverable by application development projects to known accumulations from a given date forward under defined conditions. Okay, a bit of a general statement in there about what reserves are. If we look at uh, the bottom four, we can see, well, what are the things that are inherent to reserves? What are the key attributes? Well, the first thing is it has to be discovered. So we have to drill a well. An oil and gas company has to go out and drill a well before you can even think about calling it a reserve. Then it needs to be recoverable. Okay, so we're only interested in what we can produce. Remaining. This is a very important term when we come to talk about reserves. Reserves are only, um, or are, should only be reported as of a date. Because if you think about it, reserves, if you think about it being in perhaps a tank under the ground, as we produce, that tank will go down. So the thing about reserves is they're always going to go down, you would expect, simply as a result of production. So the reserves we report today in principle, will be less tomorrow because we've produced some of it. We've taken some of it out of the ground. So the thing about reserves are they will go down unless the oil company does something about it. And finally, commercial, very important term in terms of reserves. They must be commercial based on the development projects. And we'll talk more about that as I go on. Okay, this is another way of looking at it, perhaps a little bit more simply. And it says over here, the volume of petroleum expects to be sold from assets in which the entity has no time. So what we're talking about here now is what are reserves? Reserves are what we expect to produce and sell to the market. So when an oil and gas company comes out with a reserves report, really what it's saying is, this is what I have available to sell. And they calculate it, doing enormous amount of work in terms of what they can get out of the reservoir. Huge amount of time and effort spent there. We look at how we can lift that, our lift systems, pumps, uphold, downhold, all sorts of different mechanisms. We may well have facilities, a plant, where we'll have some losses, so we need to take those losses out of what we can sell. We may well be using some of our gas as fuel. We generally take that out, but not always. We generally take that out of our reserves, because at the end of the day, what we want to tell the market, yourselves, is this is what we have available to sell, and this is what we have economically available to sell. Okay, so what are reserves? Another way, the summation of the future saleable production. That's effectively what they are. They're from a given date forward, and we take them up to a certain limit, what we call the commercial limit. And this is the economic, the license, or the contract limit, not just the volume. So let's have a think about that. Here, we have production. So we bring our oil field online. In year one, we produce. We get a, a ramp up. We get some sort of steady production here. And then we decline, decline in our reserve, in our production, sorry, through to some limit, which we call the technical limit. That's a typical oil field does that. So the volume under here is what we would call the technically recoverable volume. This is what we expect to technically recover from this oil field. But there is something in here called an economic limit. Now this economic limit in here is basically the point at which the costs to produce a barrel of oil are greater than the revenue, net of taxes and everything else, that I get. In other words, for every barrel I produce after that point, I lose money. And the thing about this one is that it's price and cost dependent. So if the price decreases, like we have seen in recent times, if you think about it, we'll need to have more barrels producing in order to meet that economic limit. So what will happen if the price decreases, that limit will go up. If the costs remain constant, then I'll need to produce more barrels 
to make the same amount of money to equal my cost. So this is one of the first things we'll be talking about today in terms of being very much related to oil price, but also costs. There's another limit in here, and this is often what we call the commercial limit, and this is things like license limits. When we get permission as an oil and gas company to produce in a country, we are given a petroleum license of some shape, and it has a distinct life, a distinct period. It could be 20 years or 30 years. For reserves, we normally cannot book reserves beyond that license limit unless we have very good evidence to demonstrate that it will be renewed. And not only will it be renewed, that we will then get the subsequent license. Normally, we only book reserves to the license limit. We also have things up here called contract limits. Contracts relate to things like gas. A lot of parts of the world, you cannot book any reserves outside what is already contracted. Because you don't know whether you're going to get another contract. And even if you do get a contract, you don't know kind of what price you're going to get. So you can't book reserves in those situations. So this is the way we, we limit our reserves. We use those sorts of commercial limits and we use economic limits. Okay, this is a fairly complicated looking diagram, but this basically is, well, is the basis behind which oil and gas companies book or classify and categorize their reserves and resources. Down at the bottom here, we have our prospective resources, and you can think of those as the exploration potential. Here we are looking at um, what we call prospects and leads where we have not yet drilled a well. So there's no well, it's purely exploration. Up here we move into the realm of what we call contingent resources. These are discoveries. So we've gone ahead, we've drilled a well, and we've discovered something. The only issue here is that we, the oil company, has not yet committed to go ahead and actually develop and produce that particular discovery. So it's kind of, it's a discovery, but we haven't yet made that big decision and we haven't yet definitely said we're going ahead to produce it. Once we have committed to it, we're up in here in reserves. And this is really what we're talking about today. But importantly, when we start talking about value and price and price falls, what we're often talking about is this little petition here, commerciality between contingent resources and reserves. What we're often talking about is how do they move backwards and forwards in here? And that often is related to the economics of the projects that we've got. Can you just clarify what's the difference between unrisk and risk resources? Now, when we start talking about things like, say, exploration resources, prospective resources, they have two risks. They have a risk that you may go out and drill a well, an exploration well, and find nothing. So we call that the geological risk. So it's the risk or the chance that we may, in fact, find something. The second risk is the risk that we may find something, but it's never, ever commercial. In other words, it's too small or it's too difficult to, to develop. So when we talk about risk resources, what we do is we take the recoverable volume we expect to get from that particular prospect and we risk it. In other words, we multiply it by the chance of geological geologically finding something and also maybe the chance of that finding being commercial. So it's a risked number. So if it was 10 and you had a 20% chance, you know, you'd end up with two. And that would be the risk number. Is there a rule of thumb for a risk to risk conversion? No, I don't think so. I'm trying to think what the rule of thumb would be. Can you? No, I don't think yeah. there's a rule of thumb because like Tony described, this is a very bespoke, very specific factor that you apply to the unrisk volumes. And it, I mean, not to be consultant speak about it, it already depends on where it is and also the commerciality of the uh, volumes that you found. So I think uh, there's really no rule of thumb if I, no, as far I, as I know. I, I don't think there is. One thing that I, I have noticed for the, the SGX listing rules that they actually do require you to list out the risks factors associated with prospective resources.
thanks. Um, part two of the question. So since the this is a seminar organized by SGX, that's a fair number of exploratory oil companies listed. Uh, most of the time, they will just disclose 2C, the, the contingent resources. So as investors, how do you make sense of this? Should we apply, say, a dollar per barrel to this? Uh, the other part will be, do you have have you seen a range uh, conversion from 2C to 2P and the average of this range, if you don't mind? Thanks. The first thing is to understand what is making up those contingent resources. The chart up there had things, subclasses of contingent resource that went all the way from non-viable right up to awaiting development decision or something like that. So you can have contingent resources that are about to move to reserves, and you can have contingent resources whereby we have no idea what we're going to do with them. So part of the issue with contingent resources is you really need to understand where they sit in those contingent resources. In other words, are they completely uneconomic or are they economic? So the problem with contingent resources is they have a risk. And the risk is, within a reasonable time frame, are they going to be able to move to reserves? In other words, are we actually going to produce them? So you need to have a fair amount of information to understand what actually makes up those contingent resources. Yeah, I agree, Tony. I can give you an example. I was looking at an um, acquisition last year for a company, and uh, they were asked GCA to come in and do an independent valuation of the asset. And uh, that asset had contingent resources as well as reserves. So the tricky part there I was trying to understand, like Tony said, why was this volume classified as contingent resources? So roughly about 80% of that was simply down to the fact that had engineering plans drawn up, everything drawn up. All they lacked was just a board decision to sanction it. So in our view, at that sort of exercise, uh, we felt that that could be you know, treated close proxy to a reserve because all you needed was a board sanction. It was in a country where you know, it wasn't really a PSE, the company can go ahead and make a decision on it. So I think the, the moral of the story is basically you really got to understand that. And once you move from reserves to valuation, you got to really understand what the, why was that volume classified contingent resources. Then you can apply the right sort of approach to the valuation on, on how you look at those volumes.